Um, so we've been talking about purification. So this is everything about negative karma and you know, karma is an extremely hidden phenomena, so we're never going to know the the whole spectrum of cause and effect. What we do know is that ethics are a good idea and that our current negative states of mind hurt ourselves and hurt others. And that is obvious just in one life, just in one day. So whether you're approaching it from this like broad past and future lives perspective or you're approaching it from an everyday perspective, aggressive, <laughs> brutal, also friendly and humorous, self-honesty is needed. And I say brutal and aggressive because what you're being challenging towards is not you. It's habits born from ignorance. You are not your ignorance. You are not the habits that are born from ignorance. So these are the enemy. Destroy them. Don't like tiptoe around them and say, oh, I'm just that kind of person. It's like, no, those are problematic. Let's get rid of them. So this kind of approach has like a confident boldness that has deep confidence in your own Buddha nature, which really means your mind's ability to evolve, to transform. So if you think about your life already, there are things that you've already trained yourself out of. There are things you used to do that you came to realize were problematic and now do less of and maybe finished altogether. And maybe it was a few hard knocks and a few kind of uh, dark nights of the soul and a few, you know, laying in the gutter moments that led to it. Or maybe it was a graceful and gentle learning over time, any combination that they're in. But you have changed something probably in your life. And this should give you confidence that change is possible if it's on purpose. It has to be on purpose. You can't just kind of incidentally get better as you age. We could get worse. Some people become older and wiser and deeper and kinder every year, and some people slip back into the worst of their like late teens and rest there in their dementia, and that's kind of where they live. So we want to be proactive about our spiritual path, which is why we talk about purification. So the ingredients to burn negative karma so that they can't bear the fruit of suffering are the four appointed powers. So the four opponent powers are refuge, regret, remedy, and resolve, because if we put them in our words, then we will remember them, right? So the first R word is refuge, which could also be reliance or also could be dependence. And so let's just sit with, what do I take refuge in? What do I take refuge from? Refuge in, refuge from. Yeah, what do I go to to soothe myself? What do I go to to shore up my spiritual path? What do I reach for in terms of progress, like ideals? So we don't even have to be talking about Buddhism, right? We could just be talking about ideals. Maybe it's peace. Maybe it's compassion. Maybe it's interdependence. Maybe it's love. What do I take refuge in? on a good day. And then on a bad day, what do I take refuge in? We would say the eight worldly concerns. So that is the negative form of refuge that is human and natural and normal, but not necessary. So those are the false refuges. Those are the like sort of short term little whiffs of happiness that we've kind of trained ourselves in. So the wrong refuge that we're doing all day is basically, how can I get more comfortable? How can I avoid discomfort? Yeah, and I'm taking refuge in things that seem to help me avoid discomfort mentally and physically, and will give me comfort mentally and physically. And then maybe on a good day, even pleasure. Yeah, even pleasure. And so we're just kind of going through our five senses taking turns, which one seems to be able to be fed, you know, so we'll feed the eyes, we'll feed the tummy, <laughs> we'll feed the ears, we'll feed the smell, we'll feel the tactile sensations, and basically our attachment just rotates around our senses trying to find one that's going to work, and that's how most of the day is spent trying to avoid discomfort and seek comfort, which is really human and also really animal and really necessary from a survival perspective. It's just that we're all pretty much doing okay survival-wise. 
like we have a roof, we have food, we have friendship, we're fine. <laughs> so all of that effort put into survival things is energy misspent. And it creates needs that aren't actually there. Like it's not enough to have something to drink. You need your special drink. It's not enough to have good food. You need special food, you know, et cetera. It's not enough to have clothes. You want fleece, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whatever, I don't know. <laughs> something swapped. So, you know, it's just interesting to see how when we're under the influence of this kind of attachment, even when we get what we want, it's not enough, which shows us it's not a reliable refuge. It's just castles made of sand. And we also are chasing the idea that acquiring or getting is going to be happiness and loss is going to be suffering. So we take refuge in things that seem to help us acquire or prevent us from losing. But the whole assumption is faulty because the assumption is those are the causes of happiness and suffering when in fact they're just conditions. Right. So you're thinking, all right, so on a good day, I'm not worried so much about comfort and discomfort. I've just made my peace with this is as good as it's going to get today, fed and watered, off we go. What can I buy? <laughs> right. What can I get? Who can I get attention from? Yeah. Who's going to notice me, entertain me, please me? Or who can I avoid that's going to be aggravating to be around? Yeah. Right? So it's a lot of that in the back of the mind. And there's also a lot of, oh, I hope I don't lose my favorite parking spot. I hope I don't lose, I don't know, whatever, little things in the day that you really bank on as happiness supports or, you know, sort of bank on as suffering avoiders. You know, just these little plans that we make that we give all the power to. And you unpack that by remembering there have been times when getting what you wanted was terrible and times when losing what you were desperate to keep was actually quite helpful to show yourself that it's not these things in and of themselves. It's always been your attitude, you know, and with everything that you get just as you want, it's never the happiness you thought it was going to be. Like you get a brand new computer, then the first thing is, oh, how does this one work? All right, did they move stuff? I've got to relearn a system. Where did they put that? Where is it? Also, is it going to be obsolete soon? Like, did I get like the, the version and now brand new versions out just a week later? I should have waited a week so I get the newest version. Will my friends judge my purchase choice? Is it going to fall apart? How do I protect it? I can't leave it in the car. The sun is not good for it. All the things. But when you had your old crappy computer, you just kind of schlepped it around, right? You just left it in the back seat. Who cares? I get sun on it. All right, it's going to die eventually. Who cares? People judge it. You're like, oh, it's five years old. It's 10 years old. Who cares? There was actually a joy in not giving it so much power, for example, right? New car, then you're worried about the first scratch. Old car, who cares? Yeah. But you banked on, I need the new car. It's going to be the happiness, right? So this is basic and obvious and things that you all know as adults, right? But the problem is, is we are taking refuge in lies. Yeah. And what we want to take refuge in is truth, because that'll actually save us from suffering and from hurting each other. You know, and the other pairs of the eight worldly concerns are related to humans, as it turns out, most specifically, which is you think if people are nice to me and speak nice to me, then I'll be happy. If they validate me, then I'll be happy. If they are, you know, clever and entertaining and humorous, then I'll be happy. Assuming that is always the case. Assuming that their motives are clear. Sometimes people validate you because they want something. Sometimes they validate you because they're condescending. You know, sometimes they validate you because they see and, see and appreciate your qualities and want to uplift and celebrate them occasionally, right? Sometimes that's the case, but when we're chasing validation, have you ever noticed when someone says, you did that amazing, and you were totally seen, totally reflected back, then you're kind of like, well, what else? Who else thinks that? Do other people think that? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'm with you, but you, you know, you like do a survey. You thought before you got your first validation, one validation would be enough. Just one person to notice how hard I'm working. And then they do, and then you want more and more and more and more. And occasionally you get a whole flood of people telling you you're, that you're amazing. And then just one says, eh, that's a bit crap actually. And that's the <laughs> only one you remember, right? 
you know, so we're silly, like this is the thing. And then we're taking refuge in, I'll be happy if I'm just validated. You won't be happy if you're just validated. Sometimes you're happy when you're validated. For Pavlov's dog, intermittent reinforcement, right? Sometimes it works, so we keep chasing it. And then, then we have this whole thing about reputation, the push and pull of reputation of what are people saying about me? What do people think about me? All this, like this is, okay, I take refuge in my good reputation. I take refuge in people thinking well of me. Well, that's flawed, right? What, you know, but we really do think life is easier if people like you and think well of you. And life is harder if they don't like you and they're saying crap about you. Because that's sort of true on the surface. But the deeper level is when you have a terrible reputation, you finally see who your real friends are, don't you? Finally see who the ones that will stick by you are. The ones who will love you regardless. You also see your own resiliency and you have that really satisfied feeling of independence of, actually, I'm okay by myself. I wish there were other humans, but anyway, I'm well shut up, y'all, right? Right. And when you have a good reputation, it's not that good. Then people want stuff from you all the time. There's all this pressure. People are always looking at you. Yeah, but, you know, a good reputation is not good in and of itself. So with these pairs, these four pairs that add up to the eight worldly concerns, it's basically just the push and pull throughout the day. All day, we're looking to, for refuge that's related to right now is not good enough or right now is too much. And it's like, not enough, good, not enough, not enough. Okay, too much, too much, too much, too much. All day, back and forth. So what we want to do is just like have a sense of humor, have self-awareness, and realize that hasn't really done us any good so far. Let's pivot to actual sources of refuge that are stable. And so we say the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, but that's not like the exhaustive list. And the reason we say they're a good refuge is because the teacher, the Buddha, has freed himself from fear, so he knows what he's talking about. It's not the ignorant leading the ignorant. It's someone who's sorted themselves out, helping us do the same. And he's skilled in freeing others from fear. Why? Because he can explain the methods how to do so. Yeah, he's not going to like pull you out of suffering and plunk you into happiness. He's going to say, here's some things that help. Take it or leave it. But what's also interesting is that we consider a valid source of refuge something that is impartial and isn't discriminating. So there's no sense of like the chosen people get all of the goods and all of the love and all of the compassion, but the non-chosen people know. Or the Buddhists get my compassion, but the non-Buddhists don't. There's none of that rubbish, right? From a valid refuge, we think impartial, unbiased, whether people are good or bad or kind or horrible, they all deserve to be free from suffering. And they will equally get shared the methods. It's totally up to them which bits they take. So these are the things that we want to look for with a real refuge. And then we approach them with this idea that we are fundamentally have the potential for health, but right now are sick. And the sickness is extra and is not us. But we have a fundamental kind of ability for health and well-being and vitality that right now is being kind of squashed by karma and disturbing emotions. So if you have this idea of, I'm a bit sick, I'm a bit unwell, then you approach the Buddha as like the doctor giving the prescription, the Dharma is like the medicine that you actually take, and the Sangha is like the nurses that help you with dosage and side effects and maybe a few steps ahead of you so you can kind of see where you're going. If you don't have that first sense of, actually, I'm not as in control of my mind and my moods as I would like to be, I'm actually a little bit more unwell than I'd like to identify as. If you don't first sit with, there's an aspect of me that is the sick person, that is the patient, then why do you, would you lean into the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha? Yeah, you think, oh, I'm fine. Yeah, so, so you have to have that sense, that really kind of weird paradox of, my birthright is absolute health. Yeah, my potential is absolutely healthy. And the current situation is I'm sick. 
And then when you hear the Buddha say, here's the problem, here's the solution, it's like when you go to the doctor with some like weird malady and they say, oh, it's just this. And you go, oh, thank you. Oh, it's just anemic. Take the iron. It's going to be fine. Yeah, you're relieved. It's not like you're even all better. You just now you know what the problem was. Now you know what the solution is. It's such a relief. But if you have the little jar of like the iron and you never take it, you're still going to be anemic, even though you know what the problem is. So the Dharma is the medicine, but it only works if you take it and digest it individually and personally. So the Dharma is the real refuge because that is your source of reliance is your own mind. Yeah. However, your own mind has trained itself out of these negative habits protects you from suffering. Yeah. So whether it's Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, or just one word that has always held you in good stead, like compassion, like love, you connect with that. And you think when you're trying to purify this concept, this refuge, let's give it a form. Let's give it a form. Why not the form of Vajrasapa? Who's Vajrasapa? Okay, white light. White light will work above the crown of my head. Let's think that this form that my refuge takes embodies everything that is divine, everything that is compassionate. And then I can say, here are my mistakes and feel held, not judged. Because they knew all the stuff before you told them. You're not, it's not groundbreaking to them, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. They know what you're up to. They know how you are. They love you anyway. They don't care. What they want is for you to not hurt yourself or others anymore. So if under that compassionate gaze, you think, okay, physically, what have I gotten up to that is not in alignment with my path or my refuge? Yeah, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. Let's do a review, a bit of a life review, a bit of a day review, whatever you've got the space for. You know, cleaning up today. There was an ant. Was I careful? Uh, okay, that goes on the list. Okay, uh, stealing, stealing. No stealing today. Well done, me, right? <laughs> but in the past, oh, did steal the candy when I was five at the supermarket. Naughty. That goes on the list. Okay, sexual misconduct, very embarrassing. Have I taken anyone's partner or cheated on my own? Da, 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 da. None of your business anyway, going on the list, right? And then you like move on, all right, speech. Yeah, speech. What was not in alignment with my path? And do you see how you're doing it as a like, whoops, not a, yeah, you're just going, oh, that wasn't my path. Yep, going on the list to purify, not ammunition for self-hatred. It's almost like, oh, thank goodness I caught that one. <sighs> thank goodness I caught that one. I hadn't really noticed how much of a habit that was, but now that I've noticed, I can stop. Okay, okay, speech. Lying is obvious. Probably not big liars, probably occasional fibbers, probably some exaggerated stories, probably, you know, some implicit deception you know, who knows, but sit with, all right, lying. How's that going? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Got some stuff on the list. Divisive speech. Have I said things that were true or untrue, but my reason for saying them is that I wanted party A to not like party B. Yeah. I wanted to split them. Maybe I wanted to rally people to my cause and my side, Maybe I just wanted people to not like each other, but there was some reason for me saying something I wanted to split. Divisiveness is not my path. Okay. Maybe it was just, you know, going on and on about politics and reinforcing, here's how we're better than them, whoever we is, whoever them is, increasing divisiveness rather than leaning in towards, why do them think that? How can we get to them so that they become us? And then us is a bigger and bigger radius. And then you feel safe with the human race. More helpful. But I think there's a lot of divisive things that we can kind of sit with and put on the list to purify. And then harsh speech is not necessarily about the content, right? It's the intent, similar to divisiveness, right? The intent is to wound. So it's not like swearing is harsh speech in and of itself, but if you were swearing with the urge to wound, it is. I think a lot of the deepest wounds that we receive are from very polite people saying little like subtle passive aggressive jabs very cleverly. And they say something that sounds kind of nice and underneath is a little barb. And five minutes later we go, oof, oh, that was actually not cool. 
they were putting me down. So wishing to wound with words, have we done that today, recently, in the past? Sarcasm, <laughs> yeah, was it just fun and games or was there a little stinger? Yeah, these kind of things, right? And again, you're just like, oh yeah, I do do that. I'm glad I noticed because now I can stop. Before you noticed, you just keep doing it. And if you were to like say to your best friend, I just realized that I do this, I'm really wanting to work on it. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I just realized. Did you know I do this? I will say, yes. <laughs> right? Thank you for noticing. <laughs> Finally. Right. So also remember, like you coming to acknowledgement about it isn't going to suddenly like reveal things to others that they didn't already kind of know. They already knew, probably intuitively, some really obviously they knew and they loved you anyway. So you might as well work on it. Right. Nothing is lost by confession, only gained. So then idle speech, you know, just rabbiting on for no reason, filling in the space out of anxiety. Classics. Yeah. So again, not the content, but the reason. Okay, so you got your speech list, and then you have your mind list, which we say covetousness, ill will, wrong views, but maybe it's easier to think attachment, anger, ignorance. Okay, what's my mood like? When have I had the opportunity to elevate my mood, but I chose not to? So we're not beating ourselves up for just kind of the default habits that come out uh, out of habit. It's when we have the thing arise, like the grumpy arise, and we give in. Or the superstitious mind, and we give in. The paranoid mind, and then we give in. If it just arose, and we go, oh, that's paranoia. Anyway, it would die a natural death. But if we go, oh, is that true? Well, it arose in my mind. It must be true. Let's investigate. And then you create a whole story and then it's off to the races. Not helpful. So when we're doing the investigation of the mental habits, it's particularly the ones that you indulged, right? It's particularly the ones you indulged. You had maybe some weird obsessive moment, you know, you were obsessing about some past relationship or you were obsessing about some past scenario or you were anticipating some future thing you really, really want to happen and you let your mind get hungry with it. It wasn't just a passing blip. It was like you let your mind get hungry. Yeah. And then it kind of perpetuated and got ahead of steam. And then you become so in the story of your attachment that you don't notice the people around you and your impact on them because you're just in the bubble of your attachment story. You know, happens to us all. And, you know, and when you have your ignorant moments, it's kind of like seemingly more benign because you're just kind of spacey and kind of vague, kind of disassociated. You know, you kind of... Do, 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 do. But there's also a uh, leave me alone, I can't be bothered. Yeah, leave me alone, I can't be bothered, that vibe. So you're just kind of like thinking through the day and is there a trend? Like sometimes like you wake up angry and then you have ignorance most of the day and then around evening attachment like that. Yeah, could be, often is. Grumpy, 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 disassociated, disassociated, full of attachment, full of attachment, and sleep and start again. We each have our different vibes, but it's interesting to examine. Or maybe you wake up all full of attachment, you want your warm, cozy bed, you want your hot cup of tea. And the way you know it's attachment is if it didn't get what it wanted, are you pissed off? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> if you didn't get what you wanted and you were okay with it, probably not attachment, you're fine. It was just a preference. Right? Like, I well, I wanted coffee. I'm out of coffee. Guess I'll have tea. And if you're like, who had the coffee? You know, okay, that was attachment. <laughs> right. So, you know, with this power of regret, you're just trying to be really, really honest, really, really clear. And that alone starts to change the pattern. And you haven't even done the meditation practice in its full-fledged form. Just noticing how you are. Yeah, because it's not you, it's just habits. And if you know the teachings on emptiness and dependent arising, it helps a whole bunch. But particularly looking at dependent arising, you think any mistake I've ever made was not made by me alone. 
that I made it. It's my responsibility. I need to purify it. And childhood, parents, socialization, weather that day, blood sugar level, et cetera, many things coming together and then you did the thing. One or two things different, you would have made a different choice. So it's somehow having this sense of, I absolutely acknowledge a fault to be a fault, but it's not my fault. That, no guilt, no shame, just regret. Yeah, like, oh, I thought that was a good idea. It turns out it was a bad idea, whoops, you know? It's the whoops. Yeah, then it's not such a big story. Okay, so then you do a remedy, and we're going to do the remedy of the Vajrasattva practice, but you can do also anything that just like stands in opposition energetically to the wrongs you've done. So, you know, you could pick just one thing as your project, like divisive speech, you know, and say, okay, I've really been going on and on and on about my sister or whatever. Yeah, and she did something that I didn't like, but now I've just basically told everyone in my life several times about how annoying it was. Everyone in my life knows how mad I am at her, except perhaps her. Maybe I should have started with her. Weird. Anyway, so everyone else knows what can I do as a countermeasure, but maybe I can speak well of her if it's genuine, if it's not forced. Can I speak well of her? Or can I bring up that same story and then share the fact that I've got a new and bigger perspective about it? and see the suffering of her bad choices or whatever. Some countermeasure, right? Speak well of her if you've spoken badly of her, that kind of thing. If you've been, you know, not careful with life, then okay, go to the bait store, buy some bait worms, put them in the garden, save some lives. You know, you don't have to do all this very formal stuff if that's not sitting well with you, but do something that's a countermeasure because it changes the pattern. It purifies, but it also changes the pattern in your daily life. Like, I actually didn't want to kill. I didn't want to be disregarding life. I actually do value life. I was just grumpy and distracted and couldn't be bothered to be careful with all those little ants or whatever it was, or I just couldn't be bothered to like check before I dug there or whatever it was. I did the thing. That's not my path. Rather than ruminate, let's do a countermeasure and clean slate. So it should never have this like heaviness, like carrying around a bag of rocks when you think of your negativities. Yeah, they're there already. So bringing them to light actually helps solve it. So you do your remedy. It could be a visualization and a mantra, or it could be some practical solution. And then you do the power of resolve. And this is a promise to yourself under the compassionate gaze of your refuge. Yeah. So you think physically, what can I stop doing negatively? Maybe you can say, I actually will never be careless about uh, insects while cleaning ever again. You've learned your lesson. You're not gonna. But maybe you know yourself and you know you're probably going to get distracted and do it again. So you say, for the rest of today, I'm going to be very, very careful about insects while I'm cleaning. Just the rest of today, very intentionally, decisively the rest of today. Yeah. Because if you say the rest of your life and then you fail, you feel crap and you've lied to yourself and you've lied to the enlightened beings and then it just creates a whole nother story to untangle yourself from. So it's almost like you have to make promises that are so small and so um, private that you would feel embarrassed to tell anyone. Like I've decided to not whine about my sister for 20 minutes. <laughs> That's all I got, 20 minutes. And during those 20 minutes, I'm gonna see no other people. That's how I will stop myself, yeah? <laughs> but like, it does help change the pattern, you know? The whole 20 minutes of money for me, all the money for God damn, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> no, right? You have to be practical with yourself, but it changes the pattern. So, you know, even if this is an armchair meditation with your feet up, just at the end of the day, asking body, speech, and mind, what was not in alignment with my path? And then for opponent powers, it can be really quiet. It can be really, you know, totally cash. Put your feet up, have the cat, drink a cup of tea, look out the window. It doesn't have to be all holy looking for it to still change the pattern. If you want it to be, you know, deeper and structured and have more continuity and to do it in a formal way, that's excellent, but it actually isn't the main thing. The main thing is what you're doing with your mind. Because if you were to do like, here's the practice, right? And you're going to do it exactly as it says and read every single word just as it says, but you have no connection with it. What is the point? 
It only works if you've made a connection with it. Yeah, that's how it works because this is a personal path. So power of resolve physically, verbally, okay, mentally. Mentally is harder, you know, especially if you're like caught in something like an anger story or an obsession story or something, you're really caught in it. But even a few seconds of doing something different breaks the cycle. And then each day you're working on it. So armchair meditation or formal meditation, either way, this is really helpful. And then if it's at the end of the day, also good to add um, rejoicing. Whereas similarly, you think body, speech, mind, what was good? Yeah, also dependently arisen, right? Also, if you hadn't been brought up the way you were, if the weather was different, if you hadn't had the resources that you have, et cetera, et cetera, the good wouldn't have been done. But good was done, and it was done by you. So be happy, you know? So you're again having that like, good was done by me, but that doesn't mean I am the good, <laughs> right? Yeah, but so I still can be happy good was done. So you think, okay, physically, helping people with that, helping people with this, carried that, chopped this, you know, whatever, just kindnesses, gave a friend a shoulder massage, you know, saved the bug that was drowning in the dishes, whatever you were doing, fed the cat, right? Cat is happy about that. Physical things, like it, we take it for granted because they're just our routines, but we have a lot of just friendly routines in our life. And we don't let ourselves pause and say, that actually does contribute to the greater good. That actually does help the world be a better place. There are plenty of people with less tools than I have who make different choices that bring down the whole thing. Thank goodness I feed my cat. Of course I do, of course I feed my cat. Some people don't feed their cat, right? Like, of course I help my friend move house. Of course, why wouldn't I? But some people don't help their friends move house, you know, whatever, like just take a minute and like really honor that there is kindness that you do physically and kindness that you do verbally. Just because we're working on not seeking validation doesn't mean we don't give validation, right? <laughs> it's sort of like a paradox. You say, all right, actually, I've noticed people have done some awesome things. I'm going to tell them because I think it's awesome. And hopefully I'll do it from a pure enough motivation that they'll just feel happy and do more for the greater good. Yeah, verbally, what else? Maybe I'm offering song. Let's make sure it was wanted, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just checking, skillful memes. Right? Maybe I've offered silence when silence is, right? Verbally, you could have said something and then you noticed maybe it wasn't your turn to talk. So it's just interesting to explore when you've kind of been in alignment with your path and mentally give yourself really a lot of, I don't know, soothing support, you know, applause any time that you could have chosen the bad mood. And for once you didn't, you could feel yourself slipping into some sort of depression and you went, not today. Yeah. Or you felt yourself like slipping into just, I am in a grump. No, you're not. That's not happening. You know, when you've caught the little window, like that is worth a party. That's a celebration. It's huge, right? Because there's so many days where we don't have any mindfulness to notice the window and then it, the day just got away from us, you know, and it's human and natural and just really cherish those moments you were able to change. So rejoicing at the end of the day. So that's kind of a purification practice in a nutshell. Um, we do Vajrasattva particularly for purification um, because Vajrasattva is the Buddha of purification and his mantra is particularly loaded to help the power of karma not multiply. Um, but lots and lots of things purify. You can use any of the main deities to purify using the four opponent powers or just alone at home in your room quietly in your armchair. Lying down, supine. Yeah, you can just you know stare at the ceiling, do your four opponent powers, like whatever's gonna get you to do it. Do it while walking the dog, whatever. Just do it, make the routine of it. Um, and then the next morning, you know, you kind of think, what were my resolutions? What was my promises that I made to myself? And just kind of motivate for a second, even if you're just quietly in the morning, two minutes sitting up in bed, just remembering the purpose of my life is what? Yeah, the things I'm wanting to change are what? Just be with it. 
Yeah, and if you can bookend your day that way, then it's like you have a meaningful life day by day by day on all the little activities in between can start to take on a richness and all be fuel for the path. And it doesn't matter if you're doing like fancy spiritual work or you're doing like, you know, sort of Luddite work or whatever work you're doing, it doesn't even matter because your motivation is now the spiritual path. It's become a spiritual path. Yeah. So this is what we hope. And then slowly, slowly the world gets better at least our mind is better able to cope with it <laughs> right so, like that so we're going to do the practice and um and then if you have some questions afterwards we can do those so just get straight back and if you need to add a cushion or subtract a cushion or whatever you need And if you know that your legs fall asleep easily, make sure that your cushion is a little further back, just supporting the tailbone and very little else, and then your legs won't fall asleep. And if you'd like, you can have your hands in the Tibetan Buddhist meditation position, left on the bottom, right on top, two thumbs touching in the lap, or just whatever you're used to or are comfortable with. Be in the body. And let your focus travel up and down your spine, encouraging it into alignment. And move your focus back and forth, across the tops of your shoulders, letting them drop into their natural position. Back and forth across your hips and your knees. Coming into physical balance. And shift your focus to the breath. Just adjust the breath, letting surface distractions settle.
When your focus drifts, just gently bring it back to the breath, intentionally. And then shift from single pointed meditation to analytical meditation by thinking to yourself, what is my spiritual refuge? What are the words of it? What is the felt sense of it? What do I rely on as my path? Explain it to yourself in your own mind. Let it connect to your heart. And think that your refuge is free from fear. That this refuge has stopped karma and disturbing emotions and has developed the mental continuum completely. Whether you call it Buddhahood or something else. And this refuge is also skilled in freeing others from fear by teaching methods. This refuge helps all sentient beings impartially, has perfect compassion, no bias. and somehow holds the characteristics of compassion and wisdom both. And so taking your idea of refuge, as well as any of those Buddhist ideas that you resonate with, imagine that they take form above the crown of your head. The form can be simple white light in the shape of a sphere. And if you feel comfortable, you can place in the center of that the figure of Vajrasattva. Brilliant white, made of translucent light. One face, two arms, 
seated in the Vajra posture on a lotus with the sun and moon disc. He holds a Vajra at his heart in his right hand and a bell in his left at the knee. And so just stable your visualization, mixing it with your ideas of refuge. And then before the compassionate gaze of your refuge object, generate the power of regret. Just regret seeing a fault to be a fault, not the heaviness of guilt, starting with the body. And so think about today and in the past, actions of killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct that you'd like to purify. Make the list to yourself, starting with the body. And then request the support of your refuge object to help you purify those physical mistakes so that they can't bear the fruit of suffering in the future, and also for you to change the pattern. Imagine making that request for support. And in response, Vajrasattva, or the simple white light, sends down a stream of white light down through the crown of your head. White light down and through your whole body, flushing your system clean. As you become filled and flushed by this white light, you can add the simple mantra of Vajrasattva seven times. Om Vajrasattva Hum, 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 
Om Vajra Sattva Hum. And repeat that mantra under your breath a few times, together with the visualization. Om Vajra Sattva Hum. Om Vajrasattva Hum. And then shift to thinking about negativities of speech, generating that power of regret, thinking about today and in the past, actions of lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, senseless speech. Just making that list before the compassionate gaze of your refuge. What ways have I used my speech that are not in alignment with my path? Just laying those bare. And then again, request, may I purify all these faults of speech so that I don't suffer in the future, so that I don't cause harm in the future. May I break these negative patterns. And in response, Vajrasattva, or the simple white light, again sends down a stream of white light through your crown, down and through you, flushing your system clean. Radiant white light filling you up, as well as moving through and out, dispelling all of that negative karma. And again, adding the mantra to the visualization. Om Vajra Sattva Hum, 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 Om Vajra Sattva Hum. And repeat that a few more times under your breath. Om Vajra Sattva Hum.
Om Vajrasattva Hum. And then shift to mind. So what negative habits and actions of mind need to be purified? What patterns do you want to change? So thinking in terms of covetousness or attachment, ill will or anger, hatred, wrong views, ignorance, etc. Just check in what your mind has been up to. Making the list. And then again, request, may I purify my mind of all these mental negativities. And in response, radiant white light coming down through the crown of your head, down and through and out, as well as filling you up, purifying the mind. And add the mantra. Om Vajrasattva Hum, 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 Om Vajrasattva Hum. Continuing the mantra under your breath. Om Vajrasattva Hum. Om Vajrasattva Hum. And now think, what can I practically promise? Ways I can change the pattern, physically, verbally, and mentally. Just make very practical, small plans, ways that you'll change the pattern. Generate that power of resolve.
physically what, verbally what, mentally what can you do differently? And for how long? And then think that Vajrasattva or the sphere of white light dissolves and absorbs into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind, stabilizing the purification. And we dedicate thinking through the power of this practice May we develop our mind to its utmost extent in order to benefit all living beings. Okay. So if this was the end of the day, also you could add rejoicing if you wanted to. Um, you can do refuge and then regret remedy, regret remedy, regret remedy, like we just did, body, speech, mind, or you can do all the regrets and all the remedies. Totally up to you, which you prefer. Um, and then little resolution at the end to bring it all together. And do think, you know, physically, verbally, mentally, three little plans just to start to change the pattern. So do you guys have questions, um, you in the room or you in the Zoom, um, about the purification or just like any random Buddhism things since I'm here and we got a little time? Random or specific questions. The Zoomers are quiet. I, 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 have, I have a question. Oh, Anna <laughs> and Delica. <laughs> yeah, Anna, go ahead. Is that Anna? Yeah. Oh. Me? Oh, no, it's not. Oh, it's Marla, I sorry. Yeah, I have a question. If you go, um, if you purify something in the past, and at the end of the purification, you see that it's completely gone, it's completely purified. But the next day you get up and you do it again. So I, I'm a little confused by this. <laughs> when is it really, really gone? <laughs> well, you purified, but that doesn't mean your habit changed. Yeah, that doesn't mean your habit changed. So then you created a whole new one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So really, we're not going to be able to fundamentally change until we realize emptiness directly but we can definitely stop our mistakes from getting momentum and causing us suffering in the future if we purify each day. So, so, if, you, yeah. so if you have, if you don't do those things anymore, but you, it, the, you know, I mean, it was maybe something that was significant that has stayed with you, but you don't do them anymore. Is it actually been purified then? And can you let it go? It, the purification isn't about whether you'll do it again or not. The purification is, did you apply the four opponent powers? Mm -hmm. Now, also stop the habit altogether. That is pro level, excellent, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But it actually is purified if you applied the four opponent powers. You're also wanting to use that as the opportunity to change the pattern and change the habit, but changing the pattern and the habit isn't the main component of purification. It's just those four opponent powers. So when you do the power of resolve, that finishes it. But sometimes the power of resolve is just until tomorrow, I won't do the thing. Knowing that as soon as you're distracted or the situation comes together again, you'll probably do it again. But that doesn't minimize the purification that you've done. 
Does that make sense? Like yeah. the changing and the purification are two separate projects. We just put them together because they obviously go together, but they're two separate things happening. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Angelica? Um, well, my question is, um, I mean, obviously this practice is a way to work with feeling bad about having regret about something. Yeah. Um, but my question is kind of like, sometimes when that comes up for me, it's like I get really hard on myself for it. Yeah. And um, and there's kind of almost this like obsession about, oh God, I can't believe I did that. Like so bad. And, yeah. Um, just kind of how to work with that so you don't get stuck in the like. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Just self criticism, a... I guess. Oh well, yeah, totally. We're we're all with you. <laughs> we're all with you. <laughs> I mean, part of it is that the way we were brought up, even if you were brought up with groovy hippie parents, as we both were, <laughs> groovy hippie parents. Um, despite the groovy hippie parents, still the way that society is structured kind of builds in the fact that we should have guilt, shame, and bad feelings when we do the wrong thing, which is not at all the Buddhist way, but we tangle it together. And what's weird is what we do is some part of us even says, if I feel bad about it, that makes up for it. Or I have to feel bad about it because that's part of making up for having done it. And that the feeling bad is the payment I make. Yeah. Yeah to kind of compensate for going off, you know? And, and I mean, even on a, like on a bad day, like on a super ego day, if someone says, oh, you did blah, 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 you go, yeah, yeah, but I feel bad about it. <laughs> like, that's also like your permission to keep doing it as long as you keep feeling bad about it, you don't have to change also. So there's all this like weird extra stuff that is not the Buddhism that creeps into our psyche. And then there's also just the way that we identify with our mistakes. You know, and we think our mistakes say something about who we are fundamentally. And that's a symptom of like grasping itself. And so if you can think, absolutely, those are negative things. And they actually don't have anything to do with me. They just live here. You know, and the analogy I always give is like a skin cancer, right? Like if you notice you have skin cancer, you're like, uh oh, take it off. But it came out of you, but it's a distortion. It was, you know, it's malformed cells. It's wrong. It's get it off. You don't think, no, no, my precious, don't take my precious. <laughs> right? I'll just burn it off, get it off. You know, but we treat our, our negativities almost like they are some fundamental intrinsic part of ourselves. And to get rid of them would be getting rid of some aspect of ourselves, like chopping off an arm you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, I don't like it, but I need it, <laughs> you know, and so we want to make sure that we're seeing it more like it's a skin cancer, like malformation coming from the ignorance and coming from all of the, the innate ignorance that we all have, that is not unique to any of us. The display of it is unique. Like we all have innate ignorance about how we exist in relation to others and all of the world. And then how that's played out has been very specific to the conditions in our life but the ignorance is the same. So there's no reason to think you're any worse than anyone else. There's also no reason to think that it's you. It's just so familiar to identify with the mistakes. So I guess the, the one piece is feeling bad about it doesn't compensate for it. So why hurt yourself further? And then the other piece is identifying with the mistake actually isn't truth. You're not that, that's not you. Mm -hmm. And anyone who had lived your same exact series of lifetimes would have made the same mistake. It was a coming together of countless conditions. So you're just doing that delicate thing of taking responsibility without taking fault. It's not your fault. Nothing you've ever done is your fault, but it's your responsibility. And nothing good you've ever done is like you primordially, you know, also like it goes both ways, right? So you don't have pride about your good stuff either. You just think, oh, that was fortunate. Those things came together. Hooray. Just like with the bad stuff, you think, oh, that was unfortunate. <laughs> no, sorry, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So somehow having that like space, it happened. It was unfortunate. It's not me. It's not my fault. Um, and then when you've got enough space from it, you can very gently without getting sucked into the like depression vortex very gently ask 
okay, what role in that whole mess is something I might still be doing? You know, like, am I still indulging a certain mental habit that could lead to a similar mistake again? So when you have enough space and objectivity, then you kind of can start exploring and teasing it out and go, well, actually, a lot of that I would never do again, because those conditions can't come together like that again. I don't really have to worry about that happening. It's done. That's not happening again. But then there are a few things where you're like, oh, actually, that could happen again if I keep thinking this way. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we wish the hippie parents had been more impactful but society got us <laughs> um, yeah other questions or thoughts Aaron has one. Oh, Aaron, yeah go ahead <laughs> zoom cube hi it's actually um terry that's going to be talking uh, what does Buddhism talk about? What role does apology play in this? Because I have done some things that have been really hurtful to people, and it's great to purify. Yeah, is it, yeah, is it really? Yeah, really good point. Um, apology and forgiveness, not as common of words, strangely, in the Buddhism, mm -hmm. but very, very important bits we can take from society. Be like, well, those are excellent add-ons. Let us use those. Not to say that Buddhism doesn't talk about apology. Um, in the Vinaya, which is mo mostly about the ethical discipline for monks and nuns, it's also just about like community dynamics. There's stuff about apology and stuff about how to confront people, when to confront people, when it should be done individually, when it should be done in a group, when people need to be booted from the community, when they need rehab, all that kind of stuff is in the Vinaya. Um, and I guess when we talk about apology, there's not like there's not a really obvious popular teaching to point to in Buddhism about apology, which is not to say that it's not wonderful. It would go into the category of like correct speech, yeah, or right speech. So uh, definitely apology is good. It's just not required for purification, which is handy because sometimes the people you've done wrong have passed away and then who can you apologize to? Similarly with forgiveness, we do, and there's a really beautiful book by His Holiness called The Wisdom of Forgiveness, and it's a good way of bringing together the way we think about forgiveness and the way Buddhism thinks about forgiveness. Really, for us, forgiveness in a way goes without saying because we're working on realizing emptiness. So there's no, what are you holding a grudge on or to if all of that is dependent arising? Yeah. So forgiveness kind of is like the collapse of identification rather than thinking you did me wrong, you meditating on emptiness and realizing, well, that happened, that happened, that happened, that happened, that happened. All of that came together and landed here and all of my stuff came to it. And that interaction of countless conditions meant I had pain that day, you know? <laughs> so who's to blame, who's to forgive? you know, all that. So we're trying to kind of work on that subtler level using wisdom when we're looking at forgiveness, which is not to say just good old fashioned forgiveness isn't amazing because it really is. But again, you know, they don't have to be in front of you to forgive them too. That's helpful to know. Yeah. Um, yeah, Anna, go ahead. I see your little yellow hand in the corner emoji. Venerable, I really wanted to thank you for something you said yesterday. And, um, you know, I talked about one of my afflictions, you know, I'm cutting back on the habit of, you know, sometimes defending myself and working on it. And I just love that you gave, I felt a sense of relief and permission that I might, there's a very good chance I'll do it again. And I actually felt relieved hearing that somehow. Um, I love that I'm better aware of it, and I appreciated that it. I just that it's it's human to make that mistake again, and not to, yeah, not to go further with it. Like I'm just very grateful. I I felt lighter when you said that. Good, good, because I mean this is the problem, isn't it? We know better way before we do better, like. <laughs> before eons before lifetime before we know better and then we can still keep doing it and then you're like this is embarrassing but the knowing better does 
interrupt the momentum and slow the momentum and make it less frequent, less intense, whatever the thing is. So assume you'll do the wrong thing again. Plan on it. <laughs> you will make mistakes, assuming you will. But if you know what the mistake potential spectrum is, then you're way more on top of it. And the duration sometimes is shorter if you've really thought about it. Like if you take something like maybe you were really, really harsh with someone who, I don't know, you had to work with and you really let them have it and you just went to town with anger and then you're thinking about it and you're purifying it and you're thinking, I do not want to vent my spleen like that again. That is harsh. That was horrible. And it's not going to correct their behavior anyway. They're just going to feel defensive and sad. Okay. Never doing that again. Wait, no, I totally will. I will. I'll do it again. It'll happen on a bad day, maybe 10 years from now. I'm going to do it again. Okay. So how can I look at the fuel that drove it? You know, go back a few steps rather than like, I'm going to stop the behavior, say, where did the behavior come from? That also helps. Like, ah, oh, it was fed by unrealistic expectations. Ah, oh, it was fed by pride and entitlement. Ah, oh, it was fed by, oh, ignorance again. <laughs> you know, like that, you know, so that can help too. But also it's helpful to think like, as you are right now, if you never, ever changed, you would still be worthy of love. Yeah. If you never, ever changed, except you got worse, way worse, you would still be worthy of love, you know? So start from there before you purify, because otherwise it feels like this struggle to better yourself. And that is just setting yourself up for disaster or like inner rebellion, inner turmoil, all that stuff. Like start from, you're fine. All of this is a bonus. You know, all this that we're working on is a bonus. You're fine. Yeah. And we want to be more, deeper, better for the sake of humanity, for the sake of all sentient beings, which will then increase our own individual well-being and sense of meaning and purpose in this world. But isn't it wonderful we have the mental space to think about that? <laughs> Like it's a bonus, you know, so starting from there. Other thoughts, questions? Zoom or Zoom? Yeah. Um, it's interesting when you're answering Angelica's question, I hadn't thought of the guilt or regret in the form of like penance or payment. Mm -hmm. So the thing I found with some Bodhisattva practice is, uh, you know, when it's with myself, I can make that peace. Mm -hmm. But when it's interacting with others, there's that habit nature of payment. Mm -hmm. And so, with you know, I've noticed that I've been noticing this a little bit with the Dharma community, the, the acceptance and the letting go. But then dealing with, you know, friends and family outside of this <laughs> little redwood forest we're in, um, sometimes they, it's almost like, yeah, it's so easy to fall back into the habit yeah. because it seems like that's almost like the transaction of forgiveness. Right. And yeah. Is, is there any advice on how to protect the mind, but not be cold and reserved mm. with others? Like, like you have to, they have to feel bad about their mistakes in order for the next Or they have to chapter. see like, like, I'll yeah. just go right into it. Like, yeah. let's say hypothetically a mom <laughs> <laughs> raised Catholic. Um, almost needs to see that that penance and pain yeah. to, to, to forget yeah. the child. Yeah, you have to feel bad about it, otherwise I won't forgive you. Right. Yeah, that. Like how to make peace with something like that. <laughs> Just go, you're not supposed to be that. <laughs> grown up. <laughs> no, I, I mean, uh, honestly, it's it, the, that part of our culture is just, oh, it's painful and it's so built in. And I think that there's an argument for sometimes going through the motions for the sake of where someone's at. If you can do it in some sort of genuine way, you know, of look here is, you know, I genuinely acknowledge my fault here, genuinely. No excuses, even though I know all the causes and conditions and all the things in the background for you in front of me who needs me to say it. I did the wrong thing. Just, I did, I did the wrong thing. And what can I do to make you trust me again, forgive me again, whatever, say the things with the humble, the humbleness that is genuinely there. 
you don't have to beat yourself up internally. Like she's not in charge of what you do in your mind, you know? So internally you don't say, and now I have to go to my room psychologically. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's hard because we get so hardwired, you know, so hardwired, but um, there's, there's a skillful means of what is our dynamic already and where is there actually opportunity for new ways of communicating and where isn't there? Because I can't just bust down the door and force a new way of communicating just because I know that way is unhealthy. You know, it's like, it might be unhealthy and it might never change. And she is okay and worthy of love just as she is. (laughs) And if she gets Alzheimer's and dementia and gets way, way worse, she's still worthy of love and all the things. And I don't deserve to be punished or feel crap or take on board all of that baggage that, you know, she came by it honest. That doesn't mean I have to take it on and then pass it on to everybody in my life. The buck stops here. May the madness end here. (laughs) But yeah, it's somehow doing that thing of, um, especially with family, is thinking, okay, what affect do do they need? Like what behavior do they need to feel placated, to feel seen, to feel heard? But you not fall into your old habit of now I have to cringe and feel shame and feel ashamed and whatever, all that stuff, like having that, no, you know, I don't need to feel bad. I need to have regret. Regret's useful. Guilt is not, you know, and having that. So before you enter into the fray, um, it's helpful to have the plan. And, um, And I'm a big fan of a short car meditation before going into the family home. Right. Park the car, then just stop for a second. <laughs> Gather yourself <laughs> and get out of the car. Yeah. Yeah. Um, time for maybe one or two more, and then we'll call it a, a session. Randoms are okay too. I think the Zoomers are good. Zoomers, you good? Oh, I see Zoomer Susan. Is it Zoom Susan? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I have a kind of random question regarding prostration. Uh, so there's something about the full prostration. I, I guess I'm very curious about the mindset. You know, I can understand maybe a, a certainly great appreciation for all that uh, Buddhism, the teachings have helped me. Um, but I also think there's a certain humility, vulnerability, uh, I don't know, giving up my ego to (laughs) what the Dharma teaches. And I think I struggle when I get to that zone and I'm like flat on the ground. I'm like, oh, this is a nice place for a nap versus trying to get the mindset of like, I feel like I get it when I'm more in like a depressive state. And for whatever reason, that melts my ego a little bit and I can really take it in and rely on, you know, the Buddhas. But when my ego is feeling okay and I'm prostrating, I'm like, eh. Um, So I was just wondering any guidance or thoughts on that yeah I mean you're going in the right direction and and, you know prostration does help with pride for sure I mean just your face in the dirt excellent for pride but what you're thinking is also I'm prostrating to my potential my potential to be a Buddha I'm prostrating to my own finished form as much as I'm prostrating to those who have already finished the path so it's a it's a multi-layered thing it's it's almost like an act of respect to yourself. Yeah. And I'm like, I am crushing the ego every time I crush my body onto the floor, like smash ego, smash. That's helpful. That's obviously my inner narrative. I sound like a small child playing video (laughs) games, ego smash, right? (laughs) But also remember that psychology of you become receptive to what you respect. So if you respect the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the Dharma path, and you're doing a physical gesture of respect, you become open, you become receptive, which means you're gonna marry up your mind with these ideals much more swiftly. It's like you get out of your own way. So there's a psychology of prostration that is really helpful to sit with. You become receptive to what you respect. Respect can be shown mentally, verbally, and physically. If you're doing all three, it goes a lot faster. So that, Yeah, so you become receptive to what you respect. You're not just respecting the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, you're respecting your own potential. Those things add to what you were talking about in terms of subjugating ego and pride and 
really noticing that there is something about, I guess, a positioning of pride physically, like a looking down that's got a physical element. Like when you're really haughty, like when you're really arrogant, you're looking down on people, but even physically you're kind of like looking down your nose at them. There's a whole series of things happening mentally, verbally, and physically. And when you go straight into the ground, that's a direct counter to that looking down at the nose. Cause now you are flat in the earth. It's humbling. And then it's hard to look at anyone down anymore. So what you don't want to do is like think, I am bad, must be punished. I am bad, must be punished. Do not do that when you prostrate, okay? <laughs> Smash ego, good. I am bad, must be punished, no. Yes, because ego is not you. It can be smashed, yes. But I am bad, must be punished. No, no, no. You have Buddha nature. You're wonderful. Don't worry about it, <laughs> okay? So when you do prostrations, you're also accumulating physical merit. And we need physical merit for resources, for support in the future, for a healthy body, for flexibility. All of these things kind of physically at our level are important, even though ultimately they become less important the more developed you are. So you're creating the cause for healthy, um, appealing to others, uh, strong body when you prostrate. Also just in the immediate, it's very good for your channels. So there's all sorts of levels of why it's a useful practice. Um, those of you that have some association with yoga and stuff, I mean, when you see a full length prostration, isn't it like a fast uh, sun salutation? Yeah, all the way up, all the way down, all the way up, all the way down, just minus downward dog in quite so bum up away because that would look very funny, but you know, mild, mild downward dog. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's interesting to see what happens if you kind of let yourself go into a flow with it, not just doing three, but like full, do the 35 Buddhas up and down at a really gentle, consistent space. Yeah, like a space, like a pace that if you had like a metronome, you know, for um, learning to play the piano, just, you know, just a nice, gentle pace. It also helps your inner energy system. So you've got these psychological reasons, you've got these merit reasons, you have this immediate benefit to your current physical body reasons, you've got pride overcoming and ego reasons. And then just remember this power of Tantra is that you're multitasking. So you're visualizing something, you're verbalizing something, and physically you're doing something simultaneously. So your whole being is engaged. You know, when you're doing just verbal or just mental or just physical, it's powerful, but it's much more powerful if you can bring these things into sync with each other. So that's part of why Tantra is faster than Sutra. Yeah. More merit, more effort means more faster. Does that sort of help or did you have a, a follow-up, Susan? Uh, no, that definitely gives me something, some other things to try when doing it. Thank you. Yeah, and all of that's a lot like I am an info dumper, I realize I will info dump many, many things a person could think about. And then once you finally get to doing it, you're like, uh, what? Um, respect. <laughs> you know, so these are just options, just pick one that resonates, you know, pick one that resonates. And, um, and then when you feel mental space for more, then you can weave in more and return to different resources and gradually build depth that way. Um, Anna, is that your emoji? Yes, it is. Eleanor, did you put your hand up before I did? Oh, Eleanor. You're okay? Sorry. Venerable, I feel like this is going to be a silly question, but I really am curious. As I'm still learning the Buddha's names and I do the prostration, is it just me? But I think I also read somewhere, try to, in one prostration, say the Buddha's name the three times. Does that really happen? Because I feel like I have just enough time for one by the time I go down and up. And I know it's technical of a question, but just so I understand the practice. Yeah, I mean, you, you want to try for getting the name of the Buddha out at least once per up and downy. <laughs> yes. But um, if you can't, it's not the end of the world. Just try and be saying all of them. Yeah, say all of them. Um, 
what happens is that it's like the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum, right? The first time you say Om Mani Padme Hum, you're tripping over it and you're trying to remember it. But then you've been saying it for five years or 10 years or 20 years, and it's like Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Padme, you know, it just rolls off because of familiarity. So the similar thing happens with these names of the 35 Buddhas. And so it's not such a tongue twister to say, you know, supreme glory, free from power, I prostrate, you know, like you just roll with it because you've said it a million times. So a lot of it is just familiarity. Um, in the beginning, really do focus on verbalizing the names that will hold you in good stead. And you can verbalize the names while marrying it up to the visualization, you know, one, two, three, you know, like that in the rows, that also helps you memorize them, which is why I use this simple image where they're all in rows. Where is it? Look, it's on here. The end. Yeah. Oh, it's behind the the end. Yes. For you guys in the gompa, sorry, it's the worst. <laughs> You've seen it all day, it's fine. Yeah, like that. So if you get three out in one prostration, just keep saying it. Yeah, just keep saying it the whole prostration and then shift to the next one. So I've been showing you guys this video of the 35 Buddha's prostrations. Eventually you do it by yourself. And then it's like you're doing one Buddha and you say that Buddha's name as many times as you can during one prostration. Then you shift the next Buddha as many times as you can during that one like that. So logistically like that. And if you always use the recording, that's okay too, but gradually, if you can memorize, it's helpful. All right, um, Zoomers, we will call it a session. Um, so thank you very much. I'll see you all on Zoom in one hour.